The Commonwealth is a destroyed landscape full of many dangers. Some environmental, like in the glowing sea, and some more direct, like the mutants in the remains of Boston. There's many places to find and stories to experience. Some stories make our hair stand up on the back of our neck or give us chills just thinking about them. And why not take a closer look at some of these places and go over 10 super spooky Fallout 4 locations. The mine can be a terrifying place. All sorts of fears and despair can be found in the deep recesses of even the most wholesome soul. Those with the most severe inflictions are often locked away from society. Thus was the case of the people who spent most of their lives inside Parsons State Insane Asylum. Pre-war, this facility housed the mentally ill in the area of Boston. Jack Cabot administrated as superintendent and oversaw the building of subterranean basement cells to hold the most difficult of patients, including Lorenzo, Jack's father, who had seemingly lost his mind after an 1894 archaeological expedition to find the lost city of Ubar. Lorenzo Cabot would uncover a mysterious artifact that somehow gave him supernatural abilities, but at the cost of his mental health. As the stability of his mind slipped away, Jack was forced to lock his father up in a protective cell in the basement. He was preventing his now supercharged father from wreaking havoc on the innocent citizens of the Commonwealth as well as his family. The Cabot family has a fascinating history that I would love to explore in a dedicated video. To sum it up quickly for the list, the Cabots are virtually ageless, in a sense. With the use of a mysterious serum made from the blood of Lorenzo, they can stay the same age physically for more than 400 years. It seems the crown Lorenzo found does have something going on with it. Now, while the Cabot family story is unsettling enough, we can find entries here of past patients, with small descriptions of their disorders, or lack thereof, available on the terminals that litter the building. Reading these entries sets the tone of this facility. To imagine what it would be like to be a prisoner of your own mind, only to become a physical prisoner as well, living the rest of your life behind these walls. Truly heartbreaking. A lone shack sits in the glowing sea, and irradiated water and barrels guard the dwelling. Inside, it looks just like any other abandoned shack we find in the Commonwealth. The skeleton of a man can be located next to a briefcase, and in the case, we can find a note detailing an evacuation plan, as well as the key for installation K21B. The key can open the trap door located inside the abandoned shack. Entering the trap door, we are met with an enormous underground bunker. This is Federal Surveillance Center K21B. Pre-war, the site was to house government surveillance employees after the bombs fell. It now rests underground, with only the most tech-savvy of groups poking around. Unfortunately, not many of the workers arrived at the bunker, and the ones that did perished due to starvation, as budget cuts had slashed the supplies that were stored here. Some would say this is just a typical story in the wasteland, but it is unsettling to know that these employees felt protected by the government they served, only to die as a cause of their bureaucracy. There is a holotape that gives us a taste of this unsettling feeling, recorded by Jeff Buzinski, an employee that witnessed his colleague fall victim to the war. This is government employee number zero one one. Uh, uh, screw this government bullshit. This is Buzinski. Sirens, they, they came so fast. The alarm. The only ones we could save were on duty. Stevens had left to get something out of his car. Stevens. He's gone. We had to close the door before he could even turn around. Protocol said we had to. I could. I could hear him screaming. That was days ago. We're already running out of food. This place was not as well stocked as they claimed. Goddamn budget cuts. If anyone is listening to this, my name is Jeff Bozinski. Tell my wife, Wilma, that I love her. Goodbye.
Pre-war, medtech research was a haven of nightmares. Upon first inspection, much like others on the list, it seems like any ordinary wasteland building. When we dive a little further into the depths, we can see things were far from average here. There is a ton of evidence to suggest that medtech was testing these drugs on unwilling subjects. Cells covered the lower levels, built to house the people who were unfortunate enough to end up here. The skeletons of these souls can be found with handcuffs and duct tape close by, and ghouls roam the halls, presumably the remains of the people who were once stuck inside this facility. The idea of being trapped here and forced to be a guinea pig for all sorts of drugs and experiments is horrifying. Placed in a cell to wait for your turn as those around you are bound and subjected to the same fate. Much like the building of the same name in the Capital Wasteland, the Dunwich Boars are no stranger to spooky happenings. A giant quarry guarded by a group of bloodthirsty raiders who have no idea what they've stumbled upon. It can be quite a dangerous area. Pre-war, Dunwich Boars LLC owned this site. The company was known for making drills and other mining equipment. Once inside, we start to see some similarities to its DC counterpart. Work here would be hazardous. It is apparent from logs found on site that workers knew this. Safety did not seem to be the top priority of Dunwich LLC. We can see flashbacks in front of our eyes of the pre-war employees doing their daily jobs. Objects jump around and move by themselves. Footsteps and rumbling can be felt and heard as we go deeper into the mine. The work site and the Dunwich building in DC probably have a stronger connection due to the rituals performed at each site. With the building being constructed over the more critical obelisk, and the boars digging into the ground here to find some kind of stone being. Both sites are references to H.P. Lovecraft's Thulu mythos, the name Dunwich being taken directly from a short story, The Dunwich Horror. The stone head found here is likely a reference to the shunned house, which tells the story of a man who begins to dig under an abandoned house and ends up unearthing the elbow of a colossal being being buried underneath. In this hole that reveals the face here at Dunwich, we can find the sacrificial blade, Krimith's Tooth. This unique weapon has ties to the semi-Lovecraftian god, Olg Koltoth. The altar in DC is dedicated to this being. Ugg Koltoth, using a similar sounding name to that of a very similar Lovecraftian creature, Yog Sothoth. One of the last flashbacks we are shown is at a ruined altar. We see some kind of strange ritual going on. Afterward, we are met with the feral ghoul remains of those who were a part of this peculiar cult-like behavior. The Lovecraft influence this place harbors, as well as the various visual and audio anomalies we find here, make it a must for the list. Just don't spend too much time here, or you may be the next one to fall to the madness. Another relic from the pre-war, Hallucinogen Inc. houses a few surprises for those who feel the need to scavenge the ruins. When entering the building, the foul smell of gases that leak into the facility fills the air. These chemicals seep into every room of the building, infecting every person foolish enough to enter. Gunners and raiders can be found fighting each other. They are lost in the cloud of the chemicals that surround them. Many of the floors have collapsed, adding more peril to the adventure ahead. The story becomes a little more unsettling when we see the rooms that were built here before the war designed to test these chemicals. And judging by the effects shown here with the gunners, it is safe to assume that it drove most subjects to madness. We can even use some of these test chambers ourselves, proving these results. Drugged water can be found littered about, showing what conditions people here were exposed to, and a peek into the psyche of the people who administrated it. No one is immune to the gas once exposed to it, including the sole survivor. Hallucinations will haunt us as we explore this building and its secrets. Adding the creepy question, is any of this even real? Criminal scum? Don't get a gun. Try Hallucigen Suppressor, a safe, reliable, and effective way to paralyze a even armored targets. Has been detected. Evacuate the building. Any sewer can be creepy. Dark, foul-smelling, and critters you can't see are all a recipe for nightmares. The Finn Street sewer is no different in this respect, but it hides a much larger mystery. Here we are, detective. <laughs> if you 
followed my instructions, you're alone. And well, if you aren't, I've already left. You better be alone. Well, come on in. I've put my work on display down here, and I'd very much like you to see it. The Finn Street Phantom used this particular sewer during his run as the resident serial killer of Boston, using various scenes of horror to portray his crimes. I want you to appreciate your surroundings, detective. I can only be myself in a place like this. Life up there is exhausting. Every day you smile at people who don't care about you one way or another because that is what you do. Down here, I really get to live. I'm happy to share it with you today, detective. As we explore this makeshift kill house, we can find holotapes left by the Phantom that tell his story. The calculated words of the Finn Street Phantom echo through this sewer. A war between detective and suspect, played out in logs, long after any of these actions hold any weight. The grisly scenes depicted by the Phantom are enough to unnerve even the most robust Wastelander. I am getting so anxious about our meeting, detective. You know, I think I have only ever wanted someone to know me. And really, I can't think of anyone who knows me as well as you do. I am your object of fascination, and you have become mine. It's humbling, detective. Youth is fleeting, and places like Sandy Cove's convalescent home remind us of this. Pre-war, this facility acted as a retirement home for the elderly, with Mr. Handy robots catering to their needs. Today, the robots are still performing their duties, though their subjects are long gone. 200 years of service to the ghosts of past residents. We are accosted by one such robot upon entering the home. We can explore the building as well as the lives of the people who once called it home. Each resident seemingly posed next to imagery that represented them in life somehow. This is short-lived as soon since from the Institute show up and start to level the place, destroying any enemy presence they may find. But why are the Sins here? Is there some kind of secret to the building only the Institute knows? Or did they just track the sole survivor? At least the residents here had hundreds of years of peace before it was so aggressively disturbed. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. An artist's work can come off as unsettling or disturbing if we don't know the full story. And even with the whole story, someone's creative expression could be a nightmare for another. This is the case when it comes to Pikmin Gallery. The gallery is truly a grisly one. Artwork painted with the blood of raiders that Pikmin has been picking off hang on the walls. The mutilated bodies of his victims litter the area. Raiders patrol the house, searching for Pikmin. Though it may seem unsettling, once we find Pikmin, if we were to help him fend off the raiders, we learn his true motives. He insists that he is assisting the sole survivor by taking care of the raider problem directly, offering you a reward for your help. That was close. Hear me? You're a dead Thank man. you. Those people deserved worse than death. You can't hide forever, Pikmin. Why did they want you so badly? <laughs> a small disagreement. They objected to my hobby of collecting their heads. Let me repay you. You don't owe me anything. I would have done it either way. That's all the more reason to reward you. If you visit my house again, look deep within my painting, Picnic for Stanley, and you will find my gratitude. Locating Pikmin's stash behind a painting, we find his blade, a unique weapon that is sure to help out against any raiders we may find out in the Commonwealth. Man tends to fear what it does not understand. The Museum of Witchcraft that still stands in Salem is a shrine to these ideals. 
dedicated to the memories of the witch trials that saw women burned at the stake who were suspected of being otherworldly or possessing supernatural powers. Upon first inspection, the only way in is through the cellar door on the side of the building. Once inside, rumbling can be felt and heard. Sounds of bone and flesh being torn apart become louder and louder as we get closer to the ground floor. Going up the stairs, we finally come face to face to the source of these noises. A monstrous death claw. This creature followed some gunners here after they had stolen its eggs. There is no calming it down. It has to be dealt with, or you will be dealt with, and quickly. With the threat of the death claw gone, we are free to explore the museum a bit further. Mannequins seem to play out scenes of the pre-war witch trials, preserving the desperation for centuries. Stories that are just waiting for someone to experience them, to relive the pain again. There is a fine line between corruption and devotion. A person invested heavily enough in a cause can sometimes do reckless things to protect their interest. The pre-war mayor of Boston walked this line with precision when he issued the construction of a mayoral shelter at taxpayers' expense. Entering the shelter, we can see the corruption as the mayor and his family refused to give up the luxuries of their lives when they moved underground. The mayor catered to his wife's every demand, building such pleasantries as a full-size gym and basketball court, a mini bar, a home theater system, and a working fireplace. After receiving an advance warning of the coming destruction, the mayor and his family retreated to their underground haven. After the bombs fell, they were able to live relatively normal lives. Many guards were hired to protect the bunker, and due to the extras that were built in the shelter, life was pretty much standard. Until survivors of the Great War began to hear word of their former mayor's deeds. One by one, they began to gather outside the Boston mayoral shelter. The family started to panic knowing that it would be just a matter of time before the growing mob would gain access to the bunker. The mayor, feeling regret for his decisions and wanting to protect his family, had one last trick up his sleeve. He would submerge himself in the bathtub with a radio. The shock from the electricity surging through the water should be enough to end his life. With this, he left a note for his wife, detailing that she should bring his body to the crowd that was forming outside, and perhaps they would feel appeased and leave his family alone. Hi, sweetheart. I'm sorry it had to end this way. I tried to build a place where our children could live comfortably. You know, I'm a family man, and know our children come first. I'd do anything for them, even at the expense of taxpayers' money. The mob has brought through before they reach the lower level. As a last resort to protect our family, I give you... Well, I... I give you myself. Take my body to the people. Tell them I died a coward. Maybe they will leave you in peace. It was too late. Hours after the mayor took his own life and before his wife could find his body in note, a member of the mob was able to get a bulldozer working, which they used to break down the door of the shelter. The crowd quickly subdued the guards, and the family watched as they made their way closer and closer to them. The group murdered everyone in sight, possibly even the mayor's children. Such cold revenge from a group that must have felt so wronged. Such atrocity for a family that had to experience one of the most hellish scenarios imagined. Greed can be a powerful drug. Thank you for watching my video on creepy places in Fallout 4, and if you enjoyed what you saw, please consider liking the video and subscribing if you want more of the same content. If you want to support the channel more directly, and see your name in the credits of the videos, check out the links in the Patreon page, as well as the YouTube channel memberships below. Some stylish shirts and stickers are available down there as well for those of you who like to look fly. As always, you can find me playing all the Fallout games live at twitch.tv slash 2 Thank you again for watching. And I hope to see you on the next one. It has been Mantis. Uh, I gotta testify. Come up in the spot looking extra fly. For the day you die, you gon' trust the sky. You gon' trust the sky, baby girl. Testify. Come up in the spot looking extra fly. For the day you die, you gon' trust the sky.